Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. We are one Unitarian uh, uh, churches in the Edmonton area, and it is good to be with us, have you here with us, here in the sanctuary and online. My name is Gordon Ritchie, and my pronouns are he, him, and I will be your service leader this morning. I will be joined by our minister, the Reverend Rosemary Morrison. We do hope that you feel welcomed here this morning. Reverend Rosemary has created the service this morning. The title of the service is, What Does Community Mean to You? She writes, Why is it so important to have a community around us? In this age of ultra-independence, relying and leaning on one another is a form of resistance. How do we become comfortable asking for help when we need it? If being independent can bring isolation and loneliness, how can we ensure that growing our beloved community to help us alleviate these familiar ailments of modern society? It is good to be together here. We have a few, uh, actually four, church announcements this morning, and we'll begin with Brandy. Good morning. I'm Brandy Muller Reed, uh, pronouns she and her. I am your current vice president, but I'm standing up here with my casino hat on. Uh, we have a casino coming up at the Starlight Casino in West Edmonton Mall, June 30th and July 1st. We have about half our roster filled. So if you can volunteer your time for that, it'd be much appreciated. Uh, some key volunteers, I've asked you to fill out the volunteer worker application form, and I've received many of them back, but if you needed a paper copy or whatever, I have one printed off and you can hand it to me today. And I think that's everything that I had to say, so thank you. Good morning, my name is Oksana Atwood, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Director of Spiritual Exploration. I'm just coming up to speak a little bit about the program that we're offering, uh, spiritual field trips. So we had uh, asked about providing a trip to the Mutart Conservatory today, uh, but I hadn't had enough people reach out to me directly. So I just wanted to say briefly that this is a, a program, it's not a social or drop-in activity. It is something that has a spiritual basis with our underlying theme of the month related to soul matters. And so it's a program, and so I have to plan it a little bit uh, in advance. So I'd like to reach out to you and to the people online and encourage you to uh, write down on the board in the back if you're interested in this type of activity, and if so, if you can leave your name so that I can contact you. I'd like to see if there's enough interest to plan something in June. So please reach out to me directly, or write your name, or if you're online, if you can email me at dre at uce .ca. Thank you very much. I know, it's a, it's a surprise what it could be about. Um, I think most people are well aware that the garage sale is coming up. Uh, today's the first day that people are supposed to bring in treasures. I think people cheated that a little bit. <laughs> but please bring things into Keeler Hall. Um, we have times also during the week that you can bring them in weekdays from 10 to 1. Um, the garage sale... Donna is going to come in and introduce one of the items that is going to be for sale while she's driving in. So for setup of the garage sale, we need help today. If anybody can do stairs, we have these signs upstairs. <laughs> We desperately need help bringing things down from the upper level. So even if you can just do one flight of stairs, that would help. If you could do a few, that would be better. If you could set up tables on Tuesday, we need help with that. 
There's sign-up sheets for the other volunteer opportunities. We're also looking for aprons like this that have pockets so the volunteers during the garage sale can put pens and tape and all the stuff that we end up leaving all over the place. <laughs> um, plus, there are little flyers, medium flyers, and posters that I'm hoping you will take to your condo, your library, just leave in your friends' houses, whatever you want. We want, this is a major fundraiser and it's very important and it's lots of fun. It's always fun to do the garage sale. But today, really important that if you can help with some of the signs or shelves from upstairs, we need your help today and on Tuesday setting up tables. If you have questions, you can ask me after the service. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation, and my pronouns are she, her. And I have two things I want to say. If you are fairly new here, or, or new, or aren't getting the newsletter, or the weekly emails, these Connect cards are on the back, um, in the foyer, on the desk, the welcome desk. Please fill it out, and uh, just you can just leave it there, I'll look for them, or pop it in the slot in front of the administrator's office, just so that we can keep, keep you on our, our mailing list, if you want to be on our mailing list. And the second thing I'd like to talk about is you use on tap this Monday coming at Brewster's around 6.30. I'll be there for conversation, for discussion, for getting to know one another for basically just coming and hanging out in a social environment um, with nobody has to do any work. Um, of course, it's free except for whatever you order. Um, so around 6.30, Brewster's in Unity Square for um, a fun, relaxing evening with fellow Unitarians from all over the city. We, we sometimes get folks from Westwood as well. So please join us. Is that it? That's it. That was a lot. There's a lot going on. Wow. Thank you, everyone. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritual questing individuals, joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, work for justice. We believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, and the search for truth and meaning in our lives. We gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 territory. A Treaty 6, a treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us let go just for a time of the everyday world. We will quiet ourselves, our devices, our phones, any electronics that you may have with you. And we will create a space in this hour to simply be together. In the spirit of love and life, we gather. Karen has a very specific prelude for us this morning. It's a hymn that we're going to be singing later on in the service. One that we have sung a couple times, but Karen's just going to refresh our memories as we listen to Call Us Again. Gretchen Haley, 
and she has written a piece called Forged in the Fire of Our Coming Together. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions, sometimes on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails as if the new zodiac capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way, as if we could prepare, as if life had ever made any promises of making sense or turning out the way we thought, as if we are not also actors in this still unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know. To release ourselves from the needing to know. The yearning to have it all figured out, and also the burden of believing we either have it all in control or none. Here in our song and in our silence, our stories and in our sharing, we make space for new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root. That is courage. Forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith that we believe still a new world is possible. That we are actually creating it here and now. Come, let us worship together. I would like to invite up Gordon and Fergie. Ferguson, which do you prefer? Whichever one, Whichever one says Ferguson Fergie. <laughs> to uh, light our chalice. Thank you. Well, yesterday was Earth Day, and throughout the service, we will be acknowledging that. And Reverend Rosemary has found a particularly beautiful uh, text for lighting the chalice. It's called Like the First Hint of Green. It's written by Jennifer McLaughlin, who writes, As the first hint of green begins to peek through the barren ground, as the little sprig grows into a healthy stem, as that stem grows into a stalk and forms a bud, as that bud opens with each new day to form a yellow daffodil. Let us be like that first hint of green, renewed by the warmth of the sun's rays and ready to emerge with new energy, ready to face the day. We light this chalice to bring the glimmer of that warmth into our space. Thank you, Fergie. So you've had a hint of our first hymn, and now you get to sing our first hymn. For those of you who are joining us online, the text should be coming up on your screen. Uh, for those of you here in the sanctuary, the text has come up miraculously behind me, thanks to our wondrous tech team. So I'll invite you to rise as you're willing and able as we join in singing, call us again. And I should mention the text written by our very own Audrey Brooks, the melody by yours truly. Let us join in singing, call us again.
Well, we have an extra special treat for you this morning. We have a time for all ages, which will be offered this morning by Oksana. The time for all ages today is uh, also a time from all ages and from a book called The Seven Sacred Teachings. And it's uh, collected by David Bouchard, one of Canada's uh, more renowned Métis authors, and Dr. Joseph Martin, who specializes in sacred texts. And they focus uh, today on humility and honesty, which we will explore together. Um, the hu humility uh, aspect is represented by wolf and wisdom is represented by beaver. So we begin our journey in the spring in the east. East is where all life begins and yellow best represents my first teaching, humility. Every day the beauty and power of creation are ignited in the east. Are you not humbled by the strength and brilliance of the rising sun? Can you not sense that there's something much stronger than you out there? Accept how small and insignificant you are for the betterment of yourself and all creation. Strive to be humble. Look to Wolf for humility and observe how Wolf does not live for himself but for the pack. Watch him bow his head in the presence of others. He does this out of deference, not fright, for he understands what a small part of the whole he plays. Learn this kind of humility. Learn to not be arrogant. Do not think too highly of yourself and do not want for yourself. Become Wolf and become humble. Is it not easy to see how insignificant you are when you marvel at the rising sun? Through Wolf, we learn that the pack is more important than the individual. Now we look up to the blue of Grandfather Sky for wisdom. To live your life based on your unique gift is to live wisely. You are not the same as your neighbor. You were created special. You are one of a kind, and so is your neighbor. So are the tree and the flower. You need only look to see what it is so. Do not ask questions. Watch and listen. Notice what is going on around you. Observe your life and the lives of others, because by watching and listening, you can learn everything you need to know. Knowledge can be learned, but wisdom must be lived. Live and learn. Look into any clear lake. You do not see your reflection. You see that of those who came before you. Through all your relations and this teaching of wisdom, you will come to use your gift to direct your life's journey. Do not live based on what you wish for. Live on what you are. Look to Beaver for wisdom. Beaver has formidable teeth. Do you know what will become of Beaver if he does not use his gift? His teeth will grow and grow and grow until they are no longer of any use to him. They will hinder him. Beaver uses his gift wisely to thrive and so must you. Now is the time to ponder over life, death and rebirth and be grateful for the gift of humility and wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Our charity of the month, as many of you know, is Child Haven International. One half of the unidentified cash that's received during the month of April is donated to Child Haven International. As the ushers circulate the offertory plates, I would like to tell you a little bit more about one of the programs that Child Haven offers. Since the beginning of Child Haven, a concerted effort has been made to improve the lives of women in Nepal and India. The objective is being accomplished primarily through the provisions of education and occupational uh, opportunities, legal aid and direct employment. Approximately 80 disadvantaged women are currently receiving training in tailoring and computer science. Over 50 women in various parts of India have been trained as soy cow technicians. Now, I know you all know about, know about the soy cow machine. I mentioned that earlier in the month. Literacy classes for village women have been uh, a benefit to hundreds of women thus far. As a direct result of Child Haven, uh, their presence in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Tibet, employment has been created for over 70 women at this time. Child Haven employs women as managers, teachers, caregivers, cooks, office staff, matrons, and professional help, uh, professionals. 
One of the purposes of, of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to be more generous in spirit and action. We take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit. An offering will, uh, was used to support this self-supporting church and as many ministries. For those of you who are online, I encourage you to go to the Child Haven International website to make a donation. We thank you for your generosity of spirit and action. Through all that we do here in this community and in the wider world, we are involved in the important spiritual work of creation and compassion. As I receive the offering, I would ask that you join me in singing, From You I Receive. an absolutely beautiful, in my judgment, responsive reading uh, to share this morning. It's called The Beatitudes of Earth Sunday. It's by Richard S. Gilbert. Uh, there is some bold font, which I will read, and some italicized font that I'll invite you to read. And again, those who are with us online, I invite you to join in as well. And so here are the words by Richard S. Gilbert. Blessed are the heavens, for they declare the power of creation. Blessed is the earth, our beloved home, for she is the planet of plenitude. Blessed are the waters thereon, for they give rise to living things. Blessed is the land, for it is the source of life abundant. Blessed is the air we breathe, for it fires us to life and love. Blessed are the beasts of the field, Blessed are the birds of the air, for they carve a graceful ark in the sky. Blessed are the mountains and the seas and the valleys, for their variety makes rich our habitat. Blessed are the fields of grain, the orchards of fruit, for they give sustenance, asking nothing in return. Blessed are the dwellers on earth, for they cherish the privilege of living. Blessed are those who protect the earth and all her creatures, from the plants of the fields to the trees of the forest. For their reward shall be harmony with the web of existence. Would you join with me in this last line? Rejoice and be glad, for the earth and her people are one. May it be so, blessed be. All right, so now it's time for a wee service leader uh, reflection. I'll begin with a question, a rather unusual question, but it does relate to Earth Day. Does anyone here talk to the trees? Hands up. Oh, okay. Yes, I was expecting a lot of hands going up. Thank you very much. I'm glad I'm not alone. I knew I wasn't going to be alone. For those of you who are online, I would invite you to type in your answer to that question as well. I expect there's some of you online that are part of this little uh, tree talking team. Now let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, while I was living in Winnipeg, I was asked to perform at the Hollow Mug Dinner Theatre. Now their productions weren't usually what we think of as dinner theatre. They were more like an hour-long musical review. If memory serves me correctly, one production that I was asked to perform in was Rose Marie. You may recall that 1936 movie starring Jeanette McDonald and Nelson. Nelson Eddy, thank you very much, who portrayed the ever so handsome Sergeant Bruce of the Mounties. One of the songs I was asked to sing was I Talk to the Trees, which is actually from the musical Paint Your Wagon, not Rosemary. Uh, attention to detail was not a strong suit of this theatrical company. <laughs> Let me read you the lyrics of this song. I talk to the trees, but they don't listen to me. I talk to the stars, but they never hear me. The breeze hasn't time to stop and hear what I say. 
I talked to them all in vain. Here in Edmonton, we are blessed with access to an absolutely beautiful river valley. And thank you, I see some nods who agree with me. I often walk along these paths and ever so often I catch myself talking to the trees, but I can't say that I often hear a response. It makes me wonder if I'm just too busy talking to them to actually hear what they are trying to tell me. Catherine Waitling writes, you follow the path that winds through the ancient forest or the marshes and uplands beyond. In search of the tree of wisdom you seek. Is it birch, guide of new beginnings, or fairy rowan, or willow, tree of moon tides and poets? Be still and listen to the whisperings of aspen. Find the courage of the holly warrior within. My love of Celtic spirituality reminds me that throughout the world, trees are held in great esteem. The meaning and symbolism of the Celtic trees honor the spirits of all living things that dwell upon the earth. The Celts were a very mystic people, having profound relationship with all of nature. Trees provided them with guiding influences from which they could gain insight, wisdom, and messages. Penning Billington, the author of The Path of Druid, Walking the Ancient Green Way, suggests that we symbolically adopt a tree in our neighborhood and watch it carefully throughout the years as it changes from season to season. What is it telling us? What are its gifts? The reader even encourages us to give the tree a name. I believe that the purpose of this is not only to create a deep and intimate relationship with one's environment, but also to take time to connect with our earth. The following is a Druid tree prayer. Oak, shade my path, I welcome your wisdom. Birch, green my way, I call upon your courage. Hemlock, heal my heart. I fast under your foliage. Pine, scent my dreaming. I gather your gifts. Tree companions all, I seek the shelter of your boughs. May my days make return on your abundance. May it be so, blessed be. Well, Reverend Rosemary, as usual, has selected one of my favorite hymns. But then again, what isn't one of my favorite hymns? <laughs> for the earth, forever turning, it's number 163 in your hymn books. Again, the text will be coming up on the screen. I invite you to rise as you're willing and able as we join in singing number 163, For the Earth, Forever Turning. <laughs>
I invite us all together into a spirit of meditation or prayer. If you are watching at home, I invite you to perhaps move away any distractions, settle yourselves into your chairs or bed or floor or here in the sanctuary in your chair. Allow that gravity to feel, for you to feel that gravity. Let it pull, pull you down. Let it, you feel yourself sink into the chair. I invite you to take a deep breath with me. In and then out. And once more in and out. Do you notice any tension in your body when you do that? Is there a catch in your throat or in your tummy, in your lungs? If so, as you're breathing regularly, see if you can breathe into that and let it go. I'm going to read a poem by Mary Oliver called This World. I'm going to read it once, and then we'll have a little bit of silence. And then I'm going to read it again, and then we'll have a little bit of silence. And if I could ask Karen, after that silence, to bring us out with just a little bit of music, please. Thank you. So a few moments of silence first, and then I will read This World by Mary Oliver. I would like to write a poem about the world that has in it nothing fancy. But it seems impossible because whatever the subject, the morning sun glimmers it. The tulip feels the heat and flaps its petals open and becomes a star. The ants bore into the peony bud and there is a dark pinprick well of sweetness. As for the stones on the beach, forget it. Each one could be set in gold. So I tried with my eyes shut, but of course the birds were singing. And the aspen trees were shaking the sweetest music out of their leaves. And that was followed by, guess what? A momentous and beautiful silence has come to all of us in little earfuls if we're not too hurried to hear it. As for spiders, how the dew hangs in their webs even if they say nothing or seem to say nothing. So fancy is the world, who knows, maybe they sing. So fancy is the world, who knows, maybe the stars sing too. And the ants, and the peonies, and the warm stones, so happy to be where they are on the beach, instead of being locked up in gold. I would like to write a poem about the world that has in it nothing fancy, but it just seems impossible. Whatever the subject, the morning sun glimmers it. The tulip feels the heat and flaps its petals open and becomes a star. The ants bore into the peony bud and there is a dark pinprick well of sweetness. As for the stones on the beach, forget it. Each one could be set in gold. 
so I tried with my eyes shut, but of course the birds were singing, and the aspen trees were shaking the sweet music out of their leaves. And that was followed by, guess what? A momentous and beautiful silence as comes to all of us in little earfuls if we're not too hurried to hear it. As for spiders, how the dew hangs on their webs even if they say nothing or seem to say nothing. So fancy is the world. Who knows? Maybe they sing. So fancy is the world, who knows, maybe the stars sing too. And the ants, and the peonies, and the warm stones, so happy to be where they are on the beach, instead of being locked up in gold. And then just a few moments of silence. As a Rogers and Hammerstein affectionado, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> we come to a time in our service each Sunday when we light candles of joy and concern, joy or concern, or both, or struggles, or celebration. We light them because marking them makes it better, brings it meaning, brings it closer to our hearts, and is a visual reminder that there are things going on in our lives that we wish to share with one another. So I invite you now to come and light a candle of joy or concern. If you line up on each side, grab a taper, come around and light your candle facing out into the cameras, if you will and then make your way back to your seat. Thank you.
all those, holding all those joys and concerns in our hearts, representing those for us. Thank you. I think we're going to sing. We're going to sing. Is that right? I should, I'm, and I'm probably not standing in the right place. <laughs> Get back to where I'm supposed to be. Yes, hymn number 1068, Rising Green. This is written by Carolyn McDade, an absolutely gorgeous piece. Please stand as you are willing and able, rise in body or spirit. Sing together 1068. <laughs> these little notes on my script. Look into the camera. Stand up straight. <laughs> Don't sway. <laughs> I watch, sometimes I watch, well no, not sometimes, I watch every service that I do and sometimes I sway and I'm, I'm just watching myself and saying, stand still for goodness sake. So I'll try to stand still and not make you dizzy. Pardon? <laughs> the reading this morning is um, a, a little brief thing by John Crestwell, Jr., a beautiful assortment. Our galaxy is one little speck among trillions of specks in the universe, like the lines on the, on the zebra or the human fingerprint no two galaxies appear to be exactly the same. There are varying solar systems and planets and many suns in these galaxies, each with different dimensions. We live in an expansive and diverse universe. But you don't have to go out to outer, outer space to learn that lesson. Right here on Earth, there are millions of species of all types animals, insects, trees, plants, and sea creatures. There's fresh water and salt water, blue water, green water, tropic and arctic climates. And then there are people, all types, with varying languages and customs. Life is a beautiful assortment. We have much to celebrate." End of quote. 
One of the things I used to love about living in a small community is that there weren't so many choices. You know, it was like one thing happening all week and everybody went to it. Here, I sometimes feel overwhelmed by all of the opportunities that present themselves to me. For example, here in Edmonton, I could go to any number of things on a Sunday morning. Well, actually, I can't. <laughs> but you could. I'd hike or bike along the beautiful river trails, go to any number of liberal faith churches like the Unity Church just down the street, the Center for Spiritual Living, the United Church of Canada, or, or even ah, go out for lunch or breakfast, brunch with friends. So why in the world do we come here to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton on a Sunday morning? We've talked a lot this month about resistance. We've looked at it from a social justice perspective or by trying not to be affected by something or someone from the point of view of saying that being joyful or content with oneself is an act of resistance and that deciding we need not go it alone is an act of resistance. Now let's talk about how being in community, how being communi a community is a form of resistance. Notice I corrected myself and I didn't say being in community. Well, I did it first and then I corrected myself. Rather, being community. Community is a thing, an entity, a body that takes on a life. It is more than the sum of its parts. Yesterday was Earth Day, so you picked up the theme. The Earth, too, is a thing, an entity, a body that is more than the sum of its parts. The first Earth Day occurred in 1970. From Heather Cox Richardson's daily letter to, uh, to America, this, this came in on April 21st. The spark for the first Earth Day was in 1962, was the 1962 publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. A marine biologist and best-selling author, Carson showed the devastating effects of people on nature by documenting the effect of modern pesticides on the natural world. She focused on the popular DDT. DDT was extremely pop popular in those days. It was developed in 1939 and used in, the, in World War II to get rid of all the mosquitoes in the South Pacific. DDT sprayed on vegetation, then washed into the oceans. It concentrated in the fish, which were eaten by the birds of prey, especially the ospreys. And the DDT caused the birds to lay eggs with very thin, fragile shells. So thin that when the parent bird tried to nest or incubate them, sit on the nest, the eggs broke and then the birds began to die off. That's the end of the quote. When Carson's book began to be serialized in The New Yorker in 1962, she was villainized. People and organizations that were making millions of dollars on pesticides and herbicides suggested and they suggest, condemned her and suggested that if we followed Carson's lead, humankind would return to the dark ages. Are you like me, as in old enough, to remember when it was almost unheard of to see a great blue heron? or an osprey, or an eagle. Thankfully, they are pr pretty plentiful now, and I often see raptors or other birds of prey on my walks and hikes. And like the eggs in the nests that got too thin when the parent bird incubated them, toxins and toxicity are very dangerous to all systems causes 
all kinds of problems, like walking on eggshells around someone so we don't upset them, or not bringing something up because we don't know how, or don't want to have a difficult or challenging conversation. Do you remember last week I talked about being a congregation kind of being like a rock tumbler? Does, do you remember that? Yeah, it is through those difficult conversations and sorting through problems together or having to say sorry and make amends that we become better people. I have to say sorry a lot, just so you know. It's how we become shiny. Or, as Mary Oliver put it, could be set in gold. I want to bring in one more concept from Peter Block's work, Community, the Structure of Belonging. He says, the word belong has two meanings. First and foremost, to belong is to be related to and to be part of something. It is membership. The experience of being at home in the broadest sense of that phrase. Belonging is best created when we join with other people in producing something that makes a place better. The second meaning of the word belong has to do with being an owner. Something belongs to me. Something belongs to you. To belong to a community is to act as creator and co-creator of that community. What I consider mine, I will build and nurture. What you consider yours, you will build and nurture. The work then is to seek in our communities a wider and deeper sense of emotional ownership. So often we have this concept of congregational life as belonging to something. We say, what church do you belong to? Or what thing do you belong to? That is somehow, that that it is something somehow outside of ourselves. When we say this congregation belongs to me, however, it changes our relationship to it entirely. We, We become shareholders because we actually already are, in fact, by the fact that we contribute with our gifts of time talent, and money. Just like anything that belongs to us, we want to take care of it, resist any harm that might come to it, and invest in its well-being. And when we do that, the community becomes an entity, a body that is more than the sum of its parts. It begins to take on a life of its own, as they say. It is only when we begin to act as if something belongs to us that we actually begin to do the work of making it better. Here we are with our individual fingerprints, living in a city that has so many choices and attractions, on a green planet that needs us to take better care of it in a galaxy that is different than any other galaxy. And yet, here we are, co-creating something from nothing. We want to be in community for sure because we are hardwired to seek out community. We are social creatures. What if we decided that this community, UCE, or another community that you feel strongly about was not a community we belong to, but rather a community that belongs to us. How do you think your mindset would change, or or would it? Would your behavior change toward UCE, or not? Would your buy-in remain the same, or would you decide you were going to volunteer more, or increase your pledge? When something belongs to us, we have a vested interest in, and our involvement would, at the very least, have a different feeling. I think there are many people here 
that already feel like co-creators of this community. I've certainly noticed some that show it with their actions, many that show it with their actions. I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to drop everything they're doing and begin volunteering 10 hours a week for UCE. Far from it. Or maybe not. What I am doing is asking you to notice how it makes you feel when instead of thinking or of belonging, you say to yourself, this belongs to me because I am responsible for its well-being and I have a share in its success. By all of us working here together at UCE, UCE will become an entity, a body that is more than the sum of its parts. When I was writing this, I became acutely aware that there may be folks that don't know even how to become a member. So I'll hang out here in the sanctuary. I just happen to have 10 copies of membership forms with me. So I'll hang out here in the sanctuary and give you the form if you need to fill it in to become a member. I have also decided, this is new to everyone, I don't know who I'm going to get to help me with it. I'll find somebody, some invested folks that are members. I've also decided to hold a new to UU class on the last Sunday of May after church in the boardroom. Watch for the newsletter and weekly emails for details. One way we can think about the difference between belonging to a community and the community belonging to us is that perhaps we won't wait for something to happen, but rather we make something happen. With this kind of mindset, UCE can't help but become more, become more of a meaningful, more energetic, more enlivened, and perhaps even more strongly, an entity, a body that is more than the sum of its parts. So may it be. Amen. And to end our service this morning, I invite you to sing with me hymn number 1064, Blue Boat Home, the best Earth, Earth Day song ever written on the face of the planet. <laughs> Please rise in body or spirit as you are willing and able.
would invite Fergie up as we extinguish our chalice this morning. And I offer you these words by Krista Taves. It is our work shared with each other in covenant that creates and sustains this beautiful community. We extinguish this chalice, but its light lives on in the directions we have chosen today. The light of this faith lives on in us together, in our hearts, minds, bodies, and spirit. Amen, and blessed be. Thank you. Thanks, Fergie. I'd like to thank everyone that participated in and prepared things for and contributed to and did the work of making this service go this morning. Thank you for the tech to the tech team and the people on Zoom, Zoom hosts and readers and things. Such a huge amount of hands make this happen on a Sunday morning, and I am grateful to each and every one of you. And now I offer you words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break, and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally, love extravagantly, and above all else, love unconditionally, for the broken world waits in darkness for the light that you hold within you. Go in peace, my gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and or rise in body or spirit as you are willing and able. And sing our Lincoln song, Carry the Flame. The words will come up. Oh, they already did. Okay. 